Hey everybody, it's uh, Resistance Live for the 23rd of February, 2018, and it's Friday in Trump land. No surprises about what we've learned just in the last hour alone, right? Um, crazy times. Okay, so um, first things first, obvious thanks to our ongoing supporters on Patreon. You can join them for as little as $2 a month at patreon.com slash resistance live. Also want to mention that the Alexis P. Morgan uh, Fellowship for Emerging Voices of Color will continue fundraising through the 15th of March. Links to both of those things are at the top of the broadcast, top of the broadcast. Um, one last thing I want to mention, by the way, um, which I haven't mentioned in quite some time, our annual Women's Leadership Conference, Activist Women's Leadership Conference, and like, boy, do we have some very big names um, in uh, women's activism who are, uh, fingers crossed, going to be on board with us by early next week. Um, is this May in Santa Barbara. Um, you can find out all about that at GaiaLeadershipProject.com slash Gaia-Women-Lead. Uh, I just want to mention, for those of you in corporate, we have new ongoing corporate rates for five and ten people. So if you want to round up all the best women in your organization, bring them on board for Santa Barbara. Um, we've got special discounts waiting for you over on that page, and I do hope as many of you who can make it to Santa Barbara will consider doing so. Okay. Um, it's a day. It's like a Friday in Trump land. And uh, so what we learned in the last hour is that Rick Gates has indeed pled guilty, or is about to plead guilty in court this afternoon. He has flipped. Um, he has cooperated with Robert Mueller, this rumored uh, cooperation that has been talked about now for about a week, has actually now apparently come to fruition, potentially pushed through the door by those new indictments that, were, that came down yesterday, um, the 32 new indictments against Manafort and Gates. So the expectation now is that Gates is going to plead guilty possibly as soon as this afternoon. So this is one of those days, no trouble being here. I'm really happy with where we're, like, the progress that we're making. Somebody said on the feed last night, by the way, um, that, you know, as much as we would all like this to wind up as quickly as possible, uh, you all may remember that I've been saying since way back in January of last year that the wheels of justice Turn, tend to turn slowly. Um, one of you said last night on the feed, this is like extending the joy of the takedown of the Trump administration. I like that attitude because I have to tell you, one of you did say today, I, I got the mom, you know, are we there yet question yet again. And I will tell you that, you know, as in every other criminal prosecution, while there is a right in the Constitution to a speedy trial, in federal courts, unless you're on the rocket docket, stick a pin in that because there's a rocket docket case now in play here. Um, the result of it is that you usually have at least a year between the time that you are arrested or indicted and the time that you go to trial. Um, so the timeline here for Gates Manafort is not at all unusual. You know, they're aiming, they, they had an April tri trial date, now it's set for September. Gates is now going to plead out guilty and cooperate. So then it'll be all on Manafort as far as those indictments go. Um, but the long and the short of it is that we still got a ways to go here. Let's not forget that Watergate, start to finish, took 18 months from the break-in to his resignation, so to Nixon's resignation. So um, so we're on a, honestly, I want to remind you all of this, on a very fast timetable here as far as Robert Mueller is concerned. He was only appointed in May of last year, and now we sit here in February, you know, some seven or eight months later, with what will now be five guilty pleas, one ongoing indictment, Actually, more than that. We have, am I thinking that? One, two, three, four, five. We may have six now, guilty pleas, uh, including Gates, because of Vander's, uh, of Vander's one. But re regardless, we are in a very strong position right now from the standpoint of this investigation. And let me just add that if you did not see Rachel Maddow's broadcast last night, I highly recommend that you go find it. Because one of the things that she did was take apart these new round of indictments that came out yesterday, which I'm going to get to in a minute. And the timeline that they set out is really, really Curious. Um, so, you know, I want to remind you all, of course, that we know we've known for quite some time that Manafort took all these many tens of millions of dollars as a result of his work in Ukraine and elsewhere. No surprises in that. But what is very curious, just to give you the short version of this, is that Gates and Manafort and their company were up against a really serious wall um, that was leading them to commit all sorts of crimes like bank fraud and what appears to be wire fraud and uh, tax evasion and all sorts of other things leading up to the time that Manafort became the chair of the Trump campaign. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, all of his money problems disappeared. Um, and he, let's keep in mind, he made a pitch to and did work for the Trump campaign for free. So the big question mark this raises is what role was Manafort playing in routing what appears to be serious Russian connections into the Trump campaign 
in exchange for what may also appear to be kind of like corrupt influx of money. Um, and that right there, you know, I got to say, it looks really bad. Again, you know, we've talked about the difference between circumstantial and direct evidence on this broadcast quite a bit. But where we are today is very curious on that front. Um, and the timeline is very suspicious. So, and now we've got gates flipping, which means we're going to get even more information on the role that Manafort played. And let's not also forget that Rick Gates stuck around in the Trump campaign for a very long time after Manafort was gone. So he's got a lot more information on the inner workings of that campaign than Manafort does, arguably. Um, even though Manafort's connections to the Russians are obviously part of the very significant potential criminal activity here. Um, so lots to say on that front. Okay, now, we've had a little bit of confusion on the feed from a legal standpoint about the fact that these, so, these new indictments were filed in Virginia. So let me just mention something. Quick law, law, old school law professor hat on here. Keep in mind that there are two different court systems inside our country. There are state law systems and there are federal law systems. Federal law system, the federal law courts are set up as district courts, then courts of appeal by region, and then the Supreme Court. State law systems are totally different by state. There's usually trial courts, courts of appeal, Supreme Courts of a state or a commonwealth, and then those can go to the Supreme Court as well for final resolution if there's an appealable issue and the Supreme Court grants what's called a writ of certiorari. The federal court system is where all of the allegations against Manafort and Gates have been filed. So the thing to keep in mind here is that there are district courts, which are the trial courts in the federal system, in every jurisdiction in the country. District court for the District of Columbia. That jurisdiction also has trial courts, the D.C. trial court system, okay? So here, the reason why I'm going this granular with you guys is I want you to understand something. There's a grand jury in the District of Columbia that has indicted Paul Manafort and Rick Gates on a series of crimes. Those are the first set of indictments. There is also a grand jury in the federal court system in the Eastern District of Virginia, which is where Paul Manafort files his taxes, that is the, the, the origin of this second set of indictments. The fact that a second set of indictments was issued out of the Eastern District of Virginia federal court does not mean that there are state claims attached to him. So the reason why this all matters, and this is to answer a question that many of you have asked, is that the pardon power, of course, as you know, if you've been watching here for quite some time, only applies to federal crimes. Where we are right now is not, and I want to repeat, not that there are state crimes which would be unpardonable that have been alleged against Paul Manafort. We have federal crimes of tax evasion, federal crimes of bank fraud, those allegations, the 32 indictments that were issued yesterday out of the Eastern District of Virginia, are still federal counts. So arguably, and I'm going to tell you, know, you guys have been watching, you know, I think this is very unlikely to happen. The president could still pardon Paul Manafort. But I want to remind you all of something very significant here. Pardons, only, pardons assume the guilt of the person that is being pardoned. So if he pardons Paul Manafort, Manafort is assumed to be guilty of the crimes of which he's been indicted. He then also can't plead the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination. And if he pardons Paul Manafort, all bets are off about what happens with impeachment on the Hill. So I am, I am still very much in the camp of not being at all concerned about pardons right now. But it is very important to me that you all understand that the pardon power is not off the table with regard to Paul Manafort, even though the Eastern District of Virginia is the place where the second set of indictments issued. Now, there's one other thing you should be aware of, circling back to the rocket docket. Eastern District of Virginia Federal Court is where I did my first court argument ever. When I first started practicing law, I was with a small firm in Alexandria, Virginia that was headed up by a guy who has since been the, um, the president of the Virginia Bar Association. Virginia was the place where I first passed the bar exam. I went to law school in Washington, D.C. My first federal court argument was in the courthouse where this grand jury has been convened investigating Paul Manafort. And that jurisdiction is well known in the federal court system by a nickname. And the nickname of that federal court is the Rocket Docket. So one of the things that the Eastern District of Virginia, and you know, like it's emblazoned on the front of the courthouse that justice delayed is justice denied. That's how serious the Eastern District of Virginia courthouse takes this idea of rapid speed justice. The likelihood that Paul Manafort could go to trial in the Eastern District of Virginia on these indictments that were issued after the ones that were issued in October in D.C. first 
is quite significant because the Eastern District of Virginia judges, um, some of whom are still well known to me, um, are adamant that quick trial dates happen in their courthouse. So the fact that Manafort, and I just want you all to understand something, there was apparently a request by Robert Mueller's team to combine the indictments that were going to be filed um, out of the grand jury in Virginia with the indictments that were going to be filed in D.C., and Manafort's counsel refused it. So he's now in a situation where he's got indictments pending in D.C. and indictments pending in the Eastern District of Virginia. There is a very strong likelihood, in my opinion, that the Eastern District of Virginia claims could go to trial first. And so he's now in a situation where, I mean, and this, I don't know why his attorneys would have done this, honestly, but he's now in a situation where he's got the rocket docket bearing down on him with regard to a potential trial date on bank fraud and tax evasion charges. Um, and he's also got these indictments hanging out in D.C., where we already know from public reporting that the judge is very unhappy with how long it is taking for, um, you know, new information to be exchanged relevant to the potential trial date of Paul Manafort. So Manafort's in a world of hurt. You know, I think there, there's no kind of denying that, even for non-lawyers at this point. But the, the reality of where he sits now is that he's he's got a very hard choice to make because assuming that he is found guilty of the charges that have been asserted against him at this point, there is no doubt that he will die in prison. He is already not a young man. And uh, with Rick Gates flipping, there is a very strong likelihood that Gates will testify against Manafort as to all of the allegations that are contained in this indictment. One of the reasons why I think that's the case, by the way, is the close proximity of these new rounds of indictments that came out yesterday and Rick Gates' announcement that he is going to plead. So Manafort now gets to decide. Die in prison? flip on the president of the United States. And, you know, I don't want to downplay the fact that, you know, if you flip on the president of the United States and you testify about the Russian oligarchs and their involvement in it, you're also still putting your life on the line. So Manafort is up against a wall and we will just have to see what happens next year. But it is very, very clear from any legal observer out there who's looking at this, that Robert Mueller has turned the screws on Paul Manafort now to a very painful point. And the choices that he has are extremely limited and none of them are good. So um, it's a great day for us as far as the dominoes falling and what may likely come next as a result of this. It is a very, very, very bad day for Paul Manafort. Um, so that's a kind of overview of where we've been in the last 24 hours on Gates and Manafort. I hope that's helpful and supportive to all of you. Um, there's a few other developments that we had questions about that I just want to flag for you guys. So lots of reporting yesterday that McMaster and Kelly may be on the way, their way out of the White House. I just want to remind you all that we have a long pattern now with this administration of trial balloons on exits being floated all the time. So we saw this, we've seen this twice now with Jeff Sessions, right? We saw it with Rex Tillerson a number of times. Every once in a while, there are these reports that come out that are sourced from inside the White House that, you know, certain officials may be on their way out. It's very plainly being used, by the way, by Trump to leverage what he wants his people to do. Like he, he, he of course, we all know this, malignant narcissist. Go back and watch the broadcast from last summer all about toxic malignant narcissism, um, if you're curious about all of that. Um, we know that one of the one of the things that he likes to do here to get people to bend to his will is to publicly humiliate them. So it would not surprise me if what's going on with McMaster and Kelly in terms of the, you know, the stuff that's been floated in the last 24 hours is part of the same pattern. Some of it is to determine what public opinion thinks about the idea, but in large part, it seems to be just a straightforward tactic of humiliation and um, public flaying until the person who is acting out against the narcissist bends one time uh, yet again on the knee to kiss the ring. So I am not particularly concerned at this moment about the potential exit of McMaster and Kelly. If it happens, it happens. We'll have even fewer grownups in the room. I'm not particularly a fan of either one of them. I'm certainly not a fan of John Kelly. Um, but I, I will add that I do not believe that either one of them is going to be on their way out like tomorrow. I, it, I just, at this point, once bit and twice shy on these sorts of announcements. Um, okay. The NRA. So, um, and I'll just add, if you want to hear about CPAC, go back and watch the broadcast I did yesterday. I really don't want to touch upon it. I do know that he's on stage. Trump is on stage right now at CPAC, or at least he was when I went on the air. I'm not really watching it. It's more of the same. Um, the thing that I do want to mention here, however, though, is that there have been some very significant rollbacks in terms of corporate partnerships with the NRA in the last 24 hours. Um, you know, again, this is one of those places where using your voice in complaint um, against institutions that do business with the NRA seems to be having finally, finally 
a major impact, um, including you know, they, like their biggest banking partners and their biggest investors in the form of BlackRock, which for those of you who don't know is like a, you know, a fund that holds an enormous amount of money in, in the gun industry um, and is now threatening that they may pull money um, if they don't get the answers that they want from the NRA and from some of the gun manufacturers. Um, all that said, public pressure right now on partnerships with the NRA is making a very big difference. And if you're looking for a place to do all of that, please get your Google on. There's a lot of different campaigns going on right now to levy that kind of pressure. I feel like it's really important for us to be focused on that. Um, and also, by the way, to remember that um, you know all this crap about arming teachers is yet another shiny object. Because there's no way, I mean, I just want to make this really clear to you. There's no way they're going to pass legislation that does that. Like it literally, it's not going to happen. There's no way that there's going to be a bill that's introduced in the House and the Senate that says it's okay for, or, you know, we're going to pay teachers a bonus in public, the public school system across the entire country, which by the way, are usually state funded, right? Public school systems are state funded. The idea that there's going to be some kind of like uniform legislation that says teachers are going to be trained. 40% of them are going to get bonuses. They're going to be taught how to strap on a gun so that they can shoot people who are potentially coming into schools. It's not going to happen. All he's doing is distracting from the narrative. And by the way, if you didn't see on Morning Joe this morning, they did this incredible montage where they showed how Wayne LaPierre's speech yesterday at CPAC and the president's comments yesterday in the Oval Office were exactly the same. So they're on the same page with regard to the talking points. Don't pay attention to what Trump is saying about this. Like, I am with Emma Gonzalez on this. Who cares what he says? What matters is what, how our voices are being used to levy pressure on people who are actually potentially going to do something about this. So that includes your representatives, it includes your senators, it includes your state representatives and senators, it includes anybody from a policy standpoint who is out there doing things to further this effort. That includes, by the way, every student who's involved in a walkout. So let me add one other thing to this. I know we've had a lot of parents on the feed, and I believe me, I get this, who are very worried about being in the jurisdictions where principals are threatening suspensions. And indeed, this has already happened in two locations in the country where students have walked out, having been threatened with multi-day suspensions, and, and have indeed received them. What I can tell you is that colleges are now stepping forward and saying, okay by us, right? MIT did this this morning. We're not gonna reject anybody because they were suspended for protesting the potential use of automatic weapons and easy access to automatic weapons to shoot kids in school. So, you know, I would not, I really wanna like warn you about this, that the way that this is being handled on a local level um, is not and should not be as scary as it looks. Um, any kid can write an application to a college um, and say, this is why the suspension is on my record. It is because I engaged in civil disobedience to protect my life and the life of other people in my school. And I did it in a, you know, en masse with kids all over the country. There is no way that universities are not going to look at that and go like, we get that. Unless, of course, you're, you're applying to like, you know, Liberty University, you know, radical right wing funded by, never mind, I'll leave that part aside. Uh, you know, nonetheless. I think we should not be terrified about the impact to our children. And honestly, one of the things I've been the most proud about seeing the comments that have been on the feed is how many of those of you out there who have teenage kids are helping your kids to organize and encouraging them to get back up and walk out of the classroom if their teachers aren't letting them leave to protest. Um, that's awesome. And that is like teaching our kids to speak truth to power, which, you know, if you watched yesterday, you know, I'm like, I'm, and you've been watching for some time, you know, I'm like all about that. So um, please continue to support our kids, support the kids out of Parkland any way that you can. Um, you know, I've shared a couple of ways to do that already on the feed. Um, and please continue to use your own voice. Like, let's remember the point that these kids have made of like, why are we having to do this? Like, why are the adults not doing this? Why are the responsible people not taking action that needs to be taken? Our voices matter too. And the impact of these kids is undeniable and amazing. And I'm so proud of it as an American to watch it happening in real time. And we have to be behind them 100% of the way and also clearing the path for them going forward. So use your voice as well. And you know, March 24th, get ready to strap on your protest boots. Some of you are, are, are on this feed are already organizing marches in your local area because there weren't ones. That's another way that you can use your resistance really, really well um, you know, going forward. So um, all that said, you know, I still continue to feel like we are at a turning point with this issue. There's a lot of things that are shifting on it. Pay attention to it. And again, wanna say it, Put the mirror up to what's happening at CPAC. It doesn't matter. Like, don't pay attention to it. I know it's outrageous. It doesn't matter. It's just propaganda to feed to the base. So put the mirror up, 
reflect it back and pay attention to what's really going on. Um, it, you know, we, we are, we are in the business of making good trouble, <laughs> so to speak, not in the business of like entertaining bad trouble. All right. Like, so I hope that's clear to everybody. All right. Um, it's only 11:22 AM here on the East coast right now, as I'm talking to all of you on, and it's Friday in Trump land. And we already know the gates is pleading guilty. Let me just add one other thing here. And I, I want to repeat something that I said yesterday, which is this. Things are moving very quickly right now behind the scenes in Robert Mueller's investigation. And that's the fantastic news about where we've been over the last two weeks. What I can tell you from my experience being involved in matters like this, um, you know, it, where I did civil litigation on securities fraud and all sorts of other kinds of fraud cases, um, and there was a, a, con a concomitant criminal component to it, when things start to move this fast, there is a momentum that builds. And so I would not be surprised if we had more outrageous breaking news between now and the end of the day. I would not be surprised if we had more indictments. I would certainly not be surprised at this point um, if we have additional breaking news about somebody else who's flipped. Not necessarily Manafort, because as I said, Manafort is in like the worst possible position you could be in, but some other lower level players who are now being compelled to flip. And let me just add one other thing that like raised big question marks in my mind after Rachel's broadcast yesterday. There are banks and banking officials who are deeply ingrained in the new allegations against Paul Manafort and Rick Gates. Um, and, you know, they're unnamed lenders in the allegations that uh, are contained in the new set of indictments. Rachel speculated a little bit last night about which one was one, and we know some of that actually already from public reporting. Um, but, you know, if by chance Deutsche Bank happens to be implicated in any of this criminal conduct that is currently on the, on the table now with Manafort and Gates, and decides that rather than be prosecuted with potential fines in the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars for being engaged in money laundering and bank fraud, um, that they're going to fully cooperate with Robert Mueller's investigation, um, you know, that's gonna be a very interesting moment in time. We already know that they've got subpoenas that are outstanding at this point, um, that are seeking information related to Trump and his family. We don't know the extent to which those materials have been complied with other than what's been reported in the public media. Some things have been turned over. But once the banking institutions start to play ball with Robert Mueller, things get even more boiling hot inside the Oval Office. Um, and uh, so who knows? You know, I, I'm, I'm keeping my eye on a couple of things there, and we'll just have to wait and see what happens next. All right. Um, that's it for today. Please don't forget your resistance actions. Please get out there and support these kids from Parkland. Oh, my gosh. My heart is, like, breaking. Um, and in any way that you can. And get organized to march. Make your phone calls. Send your faxes. Do your resist bots. Um, consider engaging in supportive civil disobedience in your local area if there are protests going on with your kids or with kids who you are close to. Support Robert Mueller and his investigation and calls for impeachment on the Hill. You all know that I think any phone call that we make should also be a phone call for impeachment. All right. Lots of love to all of you. I'll be online uh, off and on throughout the rest of the day. But, you know, it's we're not we're never done on a Friday night until nine o'clock at night in this environment. So. Uh, Stay tuned. It's a pleasure to be here. Love you all. I will see you all soon. And uh, I'll be live on Monday, definitely. Okay, bye.